Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. SUPEX, the Startup Expo, North America's premier startup conference, is March 6th and 7th, 2017, in sunny Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Affordably priced, SUPEX is a two-day international conference featuring workshops, panels, speeches, a $50,000 startup competition, and over 100 exhibitors. For more information, go to sup-x.org. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Laura Ivanova. She's the co-founder CMO at My Lab Box. Laura, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think um, what you're what you're doing is is really important, and um, you're actually making a, a difference in the world, which I think a lot of startups don't necessarily do. Um, but maybe before we get into what exactly My Lab Box is, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Absolutely. Um, well, I was born and raised in Bulgaria. Um, so okay. I'm Europe, I have a European background. Um, I uh, was a pretty adventurous child, so I started traveling around the age of 18, 19, um, and then ended up uh, being here in the U.S. Uh, at Washington University in St. Louis. I got a full scholarship, uh, which made me uh, you know, travel across the ocean to uh, start a new life here in the United States, and I've been here ever since. So it's uh, really exciting for me to uh, be in a place in my life where I am um, ultimately, in a way, living the American dream by having my own business and starting my own company and making a difference, um, I feel, in the community. So um, it's just been a whirlwind of a few years for me personally, and I just couldn't be happier with my live box and um, the changes that we are able to bring about um, in the healthcare industry here in the U.S. Sure. I, no, I, I think that's great. So was your plan to come to America or how did you decide to go to like St. Louis for, for university? Um, to be honest, I wasn't planning to come to the U S I, um, once I graduated from high school, I applied to schools all over the world, um, including Bulgaria. And, um, one thing led to the next, I ended up receiving a full scholarship, uh, merit scholarship at Washington university in St. Louis. They were very keen on attracting me to, um, their, their university. And I decided to take a chance. It was a bit of a leap of faith and, uh, uh to be honest, I was concerned. I didn't want to go. By the time I had to leave, you know, it was a big change. But I did feel at one point, and really the, the thing that pushed me forward was the sense that um, I didn't want to live with any regrets. I didn't want sure. to miss out on an opportunity to experience something new. And the way I felt, you know, home will always be there. Uh, you can always return. Sure, <laughs> to your sure. parents That's great. will welcome you back. And um, at the time in my life, it was just really important to take a chance and see what I'm made of. Had you been to St. Louis before you decided to go to university there? Not at all. I actually, um, and that's a funny story that um, I actually thought that Washington University in St. Louis is in Washington. So <laughs> actually Fair. Washington, D.C. So I did buy a ticket to D.C. I landed and I thought St. Louis must be a suburb of, of D.C. just because um, it made no sense to me. Usually in Europe, things that are like if it's the London School of Economics, it would be in London or <laughs> anything right, else. Right, right. It wouldn't be anywhere, anywhere else. So uh it was a bit of a, an adventure even just getting to St. Louis, um, and, and it's a very unique uh, setting here in the U.S., definitely kind of that gateway to the West. Uh, so I'm very fortunate, I think, that the school ended up being in that location. It taught me a lot about um, the U.S. as a country and culture. But, yeah, I definitely did not plan on being there. Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> Life in a sense takes its turn. Sure, sure. No, that's great. I, I love that. So – you you get out of university. What did you end up doing? In the, I actually kind of did a, a bit of a Frankenstein academic program. I um, initially part of my kind of hope for um, coming to the S really was the ability to have multiple majors. Okay. Um, I had enrolled in a program prior to leaving the country um, back in London and uh, in Sofia. One of them is a theater school, the other one was a business school. I really wanted to study both theater and business. Um, and I, 
at home, it wasn't really possible to double major. The universities are not set up in a way that allows you to do that. Usually you have to, at least at the time they were not, uh, you had to basically select a field of study and then just pursue that um, through your academic career. Um, when I decided to come to the U.S., my hope was that I could kind of pull those two degrees together and uh, ultimately transfer both of them at uh, Wash U. That ended up being a little bit more complicated than I thought. So I actually ended up being graduating in five years from um, three different universities in three different countries. And I have a business degree, a theater uh, degree, and a film minor. So I ended up uh, with a very um, interesting That's <laughs> awesome. uh, list of degrees. But it's really exciting. I mean, I, I think I, I just made it work. Um, I think I probably was taking about 21, 24 credits at Wash U alone. Wow. I was also remotely completing my business degree through a program in London. It's called St. Sal University in London. Um, and as an honorary um, I received a degree from um, a Bulgarian university that was facilitating my business degree because I received the highest grade um, on my thesis uh, for my business school. That's awesome. Congrats. So they, yeah, That's amazing. Me. Yeah, it was very, very, I mean, it was a great honor. Um, so, so now when people ask me, you know, do you want to go back and get an MBA or another degree? Uh, you know, I just kind of laugh. No, absolutely not. <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> You're done. You're I think done. I'm done with that part of my life. <laughs> I'd rather focus on my career and my business. Fair, fair enough. So you, you, you've kind of worked a bunch of jobs, um, but, but walk me through kind of how did my lab box come to be a reality and who came up with the idea behind it? Absolutely. Um, well, I think, um, my kind of career trajectory revolved around, um, technology, specifically e-commerce, uh, web uh, applications, um, as well as kind of marketing and PR. So those things kind of stayed uh, consistent in my professional development, uh, the ability to kind of understand business and how business works, uh, be very tech savvy, as well as really have a creative eye uh, when it comes to engaging audiences, um, e-commerce products, and just developing new solutions and, and platforms. Um, I had a fairly successful corporate career um, that after a while I found to be really unfulfilling. I, I got to a point in my life where following kind of a, a fairly serious car accident, I, I really had to ask myself um, some even more serious questions about where I was going with my life personally, what was I did, dedicating my energy and, and frankly, if my life was to end tomorrow, how proud would I feel with what I had accomplished? Um, and I think at the time really the, the biggest um, takeaway for me was that I wanted what I do day in and day out, what I wake up for, what I get in the car for, and ultimately um, dedicate my my the best years of my life to to make a difference. Um, so uh, I started looking for different kind of companies and ideas initially to consult for. I did that for about a couple of years and uh, found myself in a place where I really felt that to really get to the point where I'm contributing at my best, uh, I needed to start my own business and, and really kind of get behind ideas that are uh, bigger than what I could find out there, ideas that I really felt were much needed um, and were not in existence yet. So my lab box came um, during that search. I was um, having coffee with one of my good girlfriends, uh, Ursula Hessenflow, who is currently my co-founder and CEO of my lab box. Uh, we were catching up on life and we were just talking about what you know living and dating in Los Angeles and how how that really the craziness of it the the humor of it the um, uh, strange interactions that we sometimes have as well as some horror stories that uh, some of our friends had shared <laughs> around that same sure. experience and one theme kind of came up during our conversation which was really the discomfort and awkwardness of um, taking dating to the next level, specifically when it comes to intimate relations and um, sometimes people, how sometimes people rush into it, how little information we often have before we decide to engage with a new partner in that way. And how really there, when it comes to um, our sexual health, there seems to be this kind of massive disconnect between what we knew we should do as adults and responsible adults at that and what really we were able to do given the business of our lives, the access to resources, and everything else. Uh, personally, growing up in Europe, um, I was part of that, uh, brought up during the kind of peak, if you will, of the HIV awareness campaigns. I mean, really, the 80s and the 90s uh, saw a huge um, 
kind of spend and, and, and time and energy and effort into raising awareness around HIV and the risks of HIV and the, the importance of having annual STD screenings and screening between each partner, protection, et cetera. Coming to the U.S., I found that there really wasn't such an emphasis. Um, most cases than not, um, people treated STD testing as something that was, oh, ah, yeah, yeah, I know I should be doing it, but, you know, I'm fine. You know, I don't see anything. And uh, I feel good, you know, and sure. as we all know, uh, this is really not, I mean, about 80% of infections are asymptomatic. And we all know that this is really not a measure of um, being safe or being okay, but many people seem to kind of um, ignore that issue. And uh, what really kind of, as we were kind of talking about this issue and jokingly so at first and then more serious later, we both walked away kind of really curious because what came up in our conversation was the fact that testing was so uncomfortable and inconvenient and inaccessible made something that should ultimately be a easy health routine into kind of a point of nuisance and something that uh, in a point of avoidance. Sure. And we felt that if 2000 at the time, 13, you know, in 2013, uh, as an advanced society, uh, we felt there should be something that's easier <laughs> out sure. there. So um, we, we walked away from our conversation, um, and when we reconnected a, a few days later, uh, it turned out we had both kind of researched the subject. Uh, we had kind of gone online, looked for um, SE testing options, looked for kind of what technology existed to, to solve this and address this issue. And in that process, not only we didn't find any solutions, but also we came across some really disturbing statistics, specifically in the United States, the fact that one third of our population today, and this is 110 million wow. U.S. adults, wow. are currently living with uh, an STI. Okay. Many of them don't know it. Um, and they're kind of living day by day. Um, it is a mass epidemic. I mean, if we're looking at... Um, as big as epidemics go, I think something that impacts a third of our population should really create some urgency around coming up with some measures. Um, whether because it's a tabo taboo or anything else, this hasn't happened. Um, and we've kind of continued to exist in this, you know, we'll, we'll keep doing what we've always done. Uh, it's not working, but the change seems to just not be something that uh, organizations had been spending a lot of effort or energy in. Um, so our next step really was, we wonder how difficult, we wondered how difficult it would be to come up with a way to test from home. I think really the major takeaway for us and um, initially kind of the thinking was, well, is it the conversations we should be facilitating? You know, should we be helping people, uh, you know, ask each other for those test results and share their results in order to encourage them to test more? And kind of my gut feeling initially really was that, I mean, if we made testing easier, that really takes care of everything else. If, if it's easier, more people would do it. If more people are doing it, more people would share it. If more people shared it, more people would ask for it. Um, and it just kind of seems to be the key that unlocked uh, potentially this entire puzzle. So we started looking at what it would take. Um, and uh, as marketers, what really excited us about the, the opportunity is that the technology was there. So uh, once we started putting the pieces together from the health perspective, we were able to do that. Um, we didn't have to invent a new way to test. Uh, or a new chemical process or, or, or anything else. Um, we were able to really piece together a very unique process of testing with um, some existing technology pieces and some online innovation. Um, what really is exciting to us is that once that was done, it all really becomes a matter of educating a public. So as marketers, that's really what we do. What we focus on is um, changing behaviors, um, educating, and getting people to make hopefully better and more proactive choices. So that was kind of the evolution, if you will, of uh, My Lab Box. And since that moment, we've really been working on figuring out how to make the testing, whether that is for STDs or for any other health condition, as easy and intuitive as possible, how to put results in the hands of the user as fast as possible, and how to get them access to the resources, whether that is at-home physician consultations or expert consultations um, as fast as possible and free of charge. So today we're happy to actually not only offer testing via the MyLabBox platform, 
but also be the first and only service that allows you to receive free over-the-phone consultations with physicians in every state if you ever test positive using our service. So test to treatment, we've integrated the entire gamut, and we've made uh, maintaining your sexual health really a no-brainer. Sure. No, I, I think that's awesome, and I, I think it's it's super important. Um, I think like anything that's um, people are kind of a little bit embarrassed to be seen at certain places, right? And being able to make something that you just order and it shows up, whether it doesn't really matter what it's for, I think is awesome because a lot more people are willing to do it, right? And go through it and actually figure out if there's something wrong. And it doesn't really matter what the industry is, right? It could be anything, right? And I think I love the fact that you guys are are doing that and you're, you're you know, educating people and you're basically making things that are traditionally uncomfortable for people a lot less uncomfortable because it's just done privately. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, the consumers over the last, uh, over decade now, they've spoken loud and clear. And if you look at what happens to brick and mortar services, to um, any kind of on-demand delivery subscription type services, and some of these successes, um, several companies in that uh, the area and industry have experienced, it really comes from the need um, of people in this life that gets busier and more hectic every day to have a simplified, easy shopping solution that ultimately automates a lot of their needs, that takes care of the inconvenience for them. And when it comes to something as intimate as your health, um, having something that also gives you that sense of peace of mind and privacy that we all oftentimes um, kind of have, have gotten used to either setting aside or sacrificing just because th- there haven't been other alternatives. Um, I mean, look at, and I always laugh, you know, how many times has the uh, electric or just even the razor been reinvented? How many times has the toothbrush been reinvented? I mean, now I almost feel like they talk to you. They should, they might as well integrate Siri into your uh, shaving devices, you know? uh, but it's at the same time, you know, when it comes to other parts of your hygiene, you know, uh, there hasn't been that kind of reiteration and innovation and, and there should have been. So that's what we've done. We've really taken the sexual hygiene and your intimate hygiene. We've re- reinvented that. Um, and the other example I always laugh about and I give is if you look at like uh, maintaining your health, anything that has to do with your health that needs to be done on a routine basis, let's say brushing your teeth, right? Sure. How many times would you brush your teeth if you had to go to the dentist every single time you had to do that? Sure. And the answer is probably not so often. So by bringing some of our healthcare home, I think really, especially when it comes to prophylactic care and uh, parts of our healthcare that need, need ongoing maintenance and monitoring, bringing it home really is the only way to do it. Um, getting it on the go at home, making it as easy and accessible as possible. So we can empower the individual and also uh, give the physicians kind of more bandwidth to really focus on what what counts really, which is treating patients. Sure. So Obviously, you you gave an overview of what you guys are doing, but I, I'm curious to know. Okay, so I like I go to mylabbox.com, I I order it, shows up at my house, I follow the instructions, um, I obviously ship it back to you guys, and then and then um, within a few days I get results um, online or somebody call me. How does that work? We've really simplified at-home testing to three main steps. So you order the test online and it arrives at your doorstep in a discrete package. Nobody will know this, nothing else other than potentially your Amazon, next Amazon order. Sure. You uh, Once you open the box, it takes you literally five minutes to complete the test. You collect a small sample that you mail back to our laboratory for testing. And we've timed that, not just uh, ourselves, but also people that obviously are seeing the box for the first time. And it literally takes five minutes. Um, we actually haven't had a single test user that exceeded that amount. Okay. Once we receive your sample, it takes about 24 to hours to maybe up to five days to process your results and make them available for you to review them online in your secure account. Um, so you literally are looking at potentially three to eight days total turnaround from the moment that you press buy to the moment that you actually know your results. 
Um, and that's it. Simple as one, two, three. Buy it online, do it at home, and get your results um, online. Gotcha. Uh, these are lab certified results. They're completely diagnostic um, and they are actually something that you can either bring to your own physician or, again, if you test positive, we have completely complimentary and free physician consultations that you can do over the phone in, with physicians in your state uh, that will allow you to get treatment and prescription and be on your way, uh, on your way to a safer life and, and better health right away. Got you. And so just I, if I remember correctly, when we, when we talked before, Neither one of you really have a healthcare kind of medical background, correct? Correct. We do have um, team members on board that have very deep uh, knowledge and experience in the STD sector as well as health sector. Uh, but personally, my co-founder and I, we come from a marketing and online background. So sure. uh, we understand technology of delivering services to consumers. Mm-hmm. And we've brought the expertise on board um, to really deliver kind of the next generation of health quality and, and services um, in the, as we've built the company. See, I love that you guys are building a product in a space that you, you don't really have necessarily a background in. And, and I think it's super important to mention that is because I, I, I love that you have like almost like an outside perspective, right? And I've done just over my career projects and stuff in the healthcare space kind of on the software side. And and I think it's interesting to me that you can – that. I think you guys are an inspiring story to say, like, look, you saw a problem, you figured out how to do it, and you you didn't ha- you weren't necessarily in that space before you decided to solve that problem. I guess is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, no, and I absolutely agree with you. In fact, I think that the a huge part of the reason why we've been so successful um, and innovative has been the fact that we don't come from a health background, so we're not burdened Agreed. by kind of the history of successes or failures in the kind of development of STD testing protocols or anything else. We really come from it from the perspective of the end user as individuals who, you know, have either needed to use that service at some point in their life, who know people who need to use that service. What does that end user need? Um, And we really are building the company around uh, what the individual needs in terms of their, their, their health care rather than what uh, kind of some of the, the hiccups or the barriers um, have become over time. Uh, we initially kind of faced a lot of questions and opposition, you know, a lot of kind of pushback from some of the medical community that we reached out to, um, you know, in terms of, well, yes, but that's not how it's done. Yes, it's feasible, but that's not how it's been done historically. Yes, but what happens to follow-ups? Yes, but what happens to... Um, you know, the results of how do people know that they are ultimately meeting regulatory practices. And, and what it turned out is, you know, over time, we found those medical experts that really were, uh, saw the bigger pictures, understood the, the urgency and the need to reinvent this process. And we were able to really demonstrate um, for now three, being three years in the business and being the only and first nationwide service to offer at home STD testing, the fact that um, it works just as well, results are just as accurate, the follow up protocols don't need to change, um, people are still given access to treatment and healthcare, and even more so than they would if they were driving to a clinic, we actually are able to offer them that service at home um, and expedite their ability be on the way to treat from testing to treatment and cut that by almost a month so it, it makes a huge difference um, and it's uh, it's great to see kind of the tides turn and see the the medical community embrace what we're doing um, and learn to kind of celebrate it and as well as seeing other models in the marketplace that are entering that are looking into ways to take this to the next level whether that is um, with different testing models or, or anything else but um, it's been really exciting to see um, since we kind of uh, establish and set this footing in the ground, how many um, other and different companies have come to the market and, and really are trying to um, play in the same space and, and encourage users to bring their testing home. So sure. if anything, I see this as a huge, re- very reassuring trend um, that just shows that we are not only we're on the right track, but we also enter the market in the very, in the right place at which point both the community of users and ultimately health experts are ready to to move forward and make a change. Sure. No, I, I think that's great. And, and so are you guys looking at 
into doing other kind of home tests in, in other areas? Or is that kind of maybe down the road? It's too early? Or, or where are you kind of on that? Um, well, I think in terms of uh, my lab box, the, the next step for us really is to expand our STD serving um, tests. So really getting to a point where we are covering the full gamut. Okay. Um, we are on the verge of announcing uh, a full panel of tests um, this November. Okay. which is very exciting to us. This would include uh, not only um, things like syphilis and uh, hepatitis C and additional STDs from the ones that we offer at this time, but also very widely spread um, in new infections such as HPV and mycoplasma urea plasma. So we're looking at um, really building out the sexual health sector first, um, doing what we do well and, and doing it even better. So currently our testing and initially we really focused on the most common infections as a way to really give, um, give you the best peace of mind and attack really where the, the largest growth in infections has been uh, in recent years. Having the ability to launch the full panel of tests by the end of this month is really exciting to us because ultimately we we think it's important to be as thorough as possible. We were the first ones to launch um, online extra genital testing options, which basically means screening for infections uh, that are appear, appear in the mouth and rectal area. Um, so this allows us to detect as many as 20% more infections that may begin uh, localized than any conventional testing method. Um, so this really is kind of, fitting the vision for being as comprehensive as possible um, in providing the best at-home sexual health care. And as a next step, I think, I mean, the sky is the limit. I have always uh, thought that laboratory testing should uh, move at home. So uh, part of the reason why we started with STDs is obviously the huge need, but we've always believed that ultimately anything and everything that we a user can test for at home should be made av available to them. So um, I don't necessarily, uh, by any means, I don't exclude a future in which we become the Amazon of at-home STD testing or an at-home laboratory testing in general. Um, I do think that there's a huge opening and that there's a lot of need. Um, we, we see people every day download new apps um, and try to find answers to questions like, you know, am I... Uh, intolerance to certain foods, um, why can't I sleep? Um, people have become much more open to getting information about their genetics and their ancestry by completing tests at home. So we just see this as part of the natural evolution of bringing laboratory testing to the next level and making it as accessible to as many users as possible, not only in the U.S., but also worldwide. Sure. No, I, I think that's, that's great. So I'm curious then, did you guys self-fund at the beginning of this, or did you guys raise some money, or, or how did you kind of fund the early versions of this? We did everything and anything that really it took to keep the company going forward. Our first year was, um, by and large, self-funded, so we bootstrapped it. We put some of our life savings into this, um, and um, it really was, I mean, it's been a challenging time because as an entrepreneur you never know if, if what you're sacrificing for ultimately will will result in anything <laughs> it will, sure, it will so. live beyond beyond your savings account so uh, we did bootstrap at the beginning uh, which I think actually taught us to be very creative with our resources and uh, really make um, our budget go a long way not only in terms of uh, marketing efforts but also development efforts and, and company operations we then did a small friends and family round um, that uh, allowed us to kind of continue to move forward. Uh, we raised about a half a million dollars at the beginning of this year, and we're currently preparing for our next round of funding. So it's just really exciting to see um, how something that ultimately began uh, or was started by two people and, and kind of a bold dream um, inspire so many people and we couldn't be happier to have the uh, investor that have joined us because we we took a little bit of extra time we didn't want to start looking for money right away um, because we wanted to make sure that the people we attract and, and anybody who invests in this company um, is ultimately people that can bring value people that bring expertise and allow us to take this to the next level we weren't just looking for a get rich scheme or a way to you know get um a few millions of dollars in uh, investment dollars that we would just then, you know, blow up and disappear in a year. We really have been 
building this company um, in a way that it can be sustainable and self-sustainable and, and grow um, and are looking at investment as a really strategic cash that we can leverage to uh, improve the service uh, much more, much faster uh, and more dramatically than we would if we just continue the way we have been. Sure. No, that's great. So I'm, I'm curious, how did you meet your co-founder? Oh, goodness. I called, called her many years back in a previous life. Uh, I was doing uh, technology resources, uh, staffing and consulting. So I was working for one of the largest um, uh, IT staffing firms in the country. And uh, we were expanding our client footprint. Um, and I, I reached out, ended up having a nice conversation on the phone, met up, um, and then just continued to run into each other um, throughout um several years, uh, whether at different events or even friends parties. And finally, we just laughed one day. We're like, we should probably be friends. You know, we keep running into each other all over town. So we became friends. And, um, you know, several years later, we were having that historic coffee where we decided to kind of look into this crazy idea about how my city testing. And there we are. That, that's great. I'm always curious to know how kind of people found their co-founder. And I think it always seems a little bit kind of almost sporadic or it just seems to kind of happen, right? It's, it's, it's interesting to me anyway. Um, so I'm curious then to know where do you guys kind of, I guess, I don't know how to phrase this. Um, how are you guys looking? Well, I, I guess what's the reaction been? Like it, it it's gotta be, pretty positive for the most part, but you have to get some kind of backlash a little bit, or has it been mainly positive towards kind of the whole idea of moving this stuff kind of more at home, um, kind of just curious. Sure. Um, well, I think in terms of a reaction, it's been by and all very positive. Okay. Um, when it comes to kind of the end users and the customers being able to sign up online and use our service, uh, we have received tremendous positive support from the uh, entire community. Um, the initial kind of uh, pushback from some of the health experts that we spoke with uh, quickly dissipated uh, once we were able to really uh, show the data and, and the track record of um, having operated in space for a while and really um, being able to demonstrate kind of the same accuracy of test results as those that users may get in a clinic once we integrated the kind of um, expertise and at-home consultation components. Uh, it really, I think, reassured uh, by and large the experts in the field that we are building something to last and we are building it in a way that not only offers convenience to the user, but ultimately meets um, all of the regulatory standards and even surpasses them in some cases. So um, that has become really, a, by and large, a very positive response as well, um, including we also have on board uh, Dr. Gary Richwald, who used to head up the LA County's Department of Health STD branch. And this is the largest um, uh, kind of uh, Department of Health STD branch in the U.S. Uh -huh. um, here in, in the Los Angeles area. So he is one of our uh, C-level executive team. Um, and it's just uh, validates, again, the fact that what we are providing and offering is backed up by very solid medical expertise. In, in the space. Um, we have some interesting encounters during our fundraising efforts, and we sometimes have some funny encounters during our marketing efforts. Um, and I think largely, sometimes by ignorance, but sure, <laughs> by sure. the way people's kind of perceptions are. But I mean, early stages before we had a lot of traction, when this was just kind of an idea and nobody else had even dreamt of doing, we had some kind of uh, inappropriate questions asked sure, by uh, potential yeah. investors, you know, especially, you know, being two women and being in a kind of a sexual health space. There was a lot of presumptions about who we are and our lifestyles sure, sure. that uh, were completely wrong, but nevertheless, something we had to learn to deal with. And if anything, it, to me, it, it demonstrated kind of 
some of the stigma that we would have to combat in order to um, really get the point across of why this service is something that applies to everybody. Um, a lot of ignorance as well. I mean, people would ask us, well, this is, you know, I'm, I'm too old for this. This is just for teenagers. This is just for gay people. This is just for uh, at-risk users. And um, it really having a lot of these conversations, the educating over time, the fact that everybody's at risk as long as they, they're having sex and that STDs don't pick you based on the color of your skin or your sexual orientation or the zip code of where you live. And um, it really has, it really, I think, with the number of users growing, we've been able to um, pretty much eliminate a lot of that kind of awkward interactions that we saw at the beginning. Um, from a marketing perspective, we've had a little bit of a challenge with some platforms like, for example, you know, YouTube or, or Google search, you know, with regards to advertising products that are in the health, sexual health space because they are associated with sex. So we've actually had, uh, you know, ads being blocked. I think our Twitter account is not able to advertise uh, because it's considered a, um, I don't know, something uh, – as part of their terms of service that would fall under a sexual category. Um, so to me, I think there's still a lot of confusion um, in, which is surprising to me with uh, big platforms such as Twitter and Google that, that it, it would exist uh, about kind of where at home STD testing really would fall. Um, it's not a sex or sexual service, it is a health service. Um, uh, and the fact that it deals with an intimate part of our health is not something that uh, we feel should be in any way preventing uh, people from learning about it and taking better care of their health. Um, but again, it's just part of that uh, revolution of uh, perceptions that we've taken upon ourselves to, <laughs> to do here in the U.S. And, you know, seeing the successes month after month and year after year, um, it's really give us, given us the encouragement to keep going. And um, we, I personally, going back to kind of my desire to dedicate my life to a meaningful cause, it, it really made me feel that uh, what I'm doing, and, and I can speak as well for my co-founder, that what we've both created um, ultimately has a bigger purpose and we are making a real difference. Sure. No, I, I love that. And why I asked the question is I, I wanted, I, I guess what the point I was trying to get you to mention, and you did mention it, is you had all this pushback because you're doing something that's, you know, different, right? And new and people aren't used to it because it's not everywhere. And I, I think the fact that you basically proved the naysayers wrong and it took a while and it was a bit of a struggle. And in some cases, you're probably still dealing with some naysayers here and there. But like the fact that you guys are are basically doing this and and you know you you've been following your mission and you don't really care about the naysayers and you're trying to educate people about this stuff i think is fantastic right and i think more people need to build startups that push people out of their comfort zone and actually make a real difference absolutely um we've we faced that opposition head on um i actually tend to think very positively when i get a no to me that means i'm that much closer to a yes Sure. Um, I find that people who push back on an idea or who express concerns or challenges, ultimately they help me and the team get better at articulating Interesting. the the reasons why they shouldn't be afraid or they shouldn't be concerned and they shouldn't be hesitant uh, to embrace a solution like this. Um, the naysayers taught us ultimately how to build the service because it was their, to, to a degree, kind of their questions and their concerns or hesitations that made us really uh, look into additional areas of growth, that made us look into, okay, well, if people are concerned about what happens to treatment options, how do we integrate treatment into the service? So if anything, um, it, instead of being discouraged by the naysayers, very early on I decided that um, I'm personally and, and, and the team would use their feedback as a way to get better and to answer questions before they even come up. <laughs> because I think to me what, what, what a naysayer means is that I as a marketer um, or as a customer facing um, service, we have not done a good enough job in explaining our value proposition. Interesting. Um, and, and the less no's we get, the more it tells me that we're actually doing a better job at doing that, <laughs> educating sure. faster and better. Uh, so they're a good barometer. I mean, I, I, as an entrepreneur, I would say embrace the naysayers by all means and uh, thank them for their feedback because they will make your business better. 
that that's actually really good advice. I, I like I, I don't know how to you know say that better myself. Really, like that that's great advice for people though, right? I think a lot of people cower when they you know hear negative feedback, but when you can use it to turn it into a positive or adjust your kind of messaging or marketing to you know so that you don't hear that kind of negativity again, I, I think you turn it into a success, right? I agree. Absolutely. hundred percent. So we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So maybe let's close the show with mentioning where people can get more information about you guys and any other social media links you want to mention. To learn more about my lab box and to take advantage of the first nationwide at home STD testing service, go to www.mylabbox.com. That is two B's, my lab and box. And uh, you can uh, Take your pick from uh, many of our selections. You can do um, any of our tests a la carte, or you can get uh, a combination box, such as our safe box or Uber box, that allows you to test for the most common infections. Once you order your kit, expect it to arrive at your door in about a couple of days' time. And uh, it will take you about five minutes to complete your test and mail it back to us. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at MyLabBox, um, as well as follow our YouTube channel for any kind of tips and unboxings of our products. We look forward to seeing you and helping you lead a better, safer, and sexier life. Perfect. Well, Laura, I really appreciate you taking the time of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Kevin. Perfect. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep them in the future.